Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Richardson. I'm Managing Director at Save Your Skin Foundation. I welcome you to today's webinar presentation titled Treatment Options for Melanoma Patients in the Adjuvant Setting. Adjuvant treatment has been a special focus of ours in 2018, as we believe the ability of stage three melanoma patients to receive innovative treatments is key to survival and to the reduction of progression to stage four disease. The term adjuvant refers to patients with a stage two or three diagnosis. The majority of adjuvant patients typically undergo surgery to have their tumors removed, but are not given immunotherapy or targeted therapy to prevent recurrence of the disease, despite a known high risk of relapse and mortality. Melanoma is an aggressive cancer. Stage three melanoma means the cancer has spread from skin cells to the lymphatic system and poses a dangerous risk for spread to organs, which is what depicts the stage four diagnosis. In September, we conducted a survey to learn about the patient experience with melanoma in the adjuvant setting. The goal of the survey was to assess the physical, emotional, and financial impact melanoma has on patients and their families and caregivers, and to get a picture of the treatment plan of the average melanoma patient, what treatment access limitations they have encountered, and what they look for in potential treatment options. The information that survey respondents shared has enabled Save Your Skin to provide comprehensive submissions representing the patient perspective on adjuvant melanoma treatment to the Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review, or PCODER, as well as INES in Quebec. These bodies, these bodies use such submission, submissions to assess cancer drugs and make recommendations to Canada's provinces and territories in guiding their drug funding decisions. Around the same time that we released our report on the adjuvant survey, there was an exciting announcement from Health Canada. They have approved the first adjuvant treatment for melanoma to prevent relapse following surgery. Targeted therapy combination to Findlar mechanist or debrafenib trametinib for the adjuvant treatment of melanoma patients with a BRAF B600 mutation has been approved by Health Canada. To help us answer the questions that come from this excitement in the adjuvant melanoma landscape in Canada today, we are honored to welcome four valued panelists. Dr. Joelle Claveau, a medical on oncologist from Quebec City. Adrian Ganaratna, PhD, medical science liaison, solid tumors with Novartis Pharmaceuticals Canada. Dr. Claveau will share his key insights into what the landscape of adjuvant melanoma immuno-oncology treatment looks like for the near future in Canada. Dr. Adrian Gunaratna will detail the science behind targeted therapy and what is coming for Canadian melanoma patients with a BRAF positive mutation in the adjuvant setting. The discussion will continue with a patient and a caregiver both having had treatment access challenges in the adjuvant melanoma setting. Myself, Natalie Richardson from Ontario, and Ayub Hadjiev from British Columbia, who will share how our experiences impacted our lives and that of our families. Facilitating this discussion will be Kathy Barnard, melanoma survivor and founder and president of Save Your Skin Foundation. Before we get started, there are a few things I would like to mention. All participants in the audience for today's webinar will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the session. There will be a question and answer portion at the end of the presentation. You will see at the right-hand side of your screen an option to type in a question. Please feel free to ask your questions throughout the presentation, and we will do our best to answer them in the last segment. If there are any questions that do not get an immediate answer, we'll contact you with a reply and any discussion you wish to have via email after the webinar. Thanks again for joining us. We'll now begin the presentation. I hand this over to you, Kathy. Thanks, Nat. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as you can see, we have four great presentations, so I'd like to uh, get started. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Joelle Clavo. Good morning, Dr. Clavo. Hello. Do you have my slide? Um, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, I'm oh, just. Yep. We can hear you. <laughs> We're just pulling up your slides. There we go. Do I open the camera so you see me? We see you. Yay, hello. Great, so let's remove that. So uh, like this, people will see my slide and myself a little bit, not too big. There you go, you're perfect. And then you, so welcome everybody. 
Thanks, uh, Cathy and Natalie, for organizing that. It's a very exciting time right now in Canada for melanoma. And um, we're very fortunate to have new options coming up for the patients. We see patients uh, that need uh, that need those, uh, those treatment every day. And uh, we will make a brief overview. So next slide. Um, at Hôtel Dieu de Québec, I'm working at uh, Centre Hospitalier Universitaire de Québec at the Melanoma Clinic. We are collaborating with many companies, especially in clinical trials. So those are the companies we have been doing some research and uh, clinical work with them and teaching and uh, et cetera. So next slide. Next slide. So for those that follow the field of melanoma, we know that Dr. Georgina Long is a one word expert in the field of melanoma. She's in the Sydney Melanoma Unit. And now it's called uh, uh, Melanoma Institute of Australia. And uh, she, uh, she presents very well on the topic of melanoma. So this is a slide I borrowed from her, where we see like the, now we have a long bridge in the melanoma field. And uh, we have two ways to treat. Before we used to have chemotherapy and uh, interferon for the adjuvant setting. And now we don't use um, any more chemotherapy. We can use targeted therapy, which is a, a treatment directly targeting the, the genes um, of the cancer. And this is very efficient. And as you will hear, you will uh, hear in the next few minutes, uh, you will understand more this treatment. And on the, on the other side, we have immunotherapy. Immunotherapy can look a little bit more bumpy, uh, but most of the time, immunotherapy is well tolerated and it's a very good option, especially for those patients that don't have the BRAF mutation. You need to have a special mutation to receive targeted therapy. And um, often, immunotherapy can be used for patients that also have this mutation either in combination with targeted therapy after or before. Next slide. Not going too much into detail, but the researchers now have found like many pathways in cancer cells. And this we call the MAP kinase pathway. And in that diagram, we see that there is many different molecules and that we could uh, block the pathway at this level we call BRAF or lower down we call MEC and this is what we call targeted therapy. So there is two different uh, combo that can be prescribed for patients having targeted therapy. We call Dabrafamil plus Tramitznib which is a combo by Novartis uh, and Roche have Vimrafamil plus Cobimitzinib. So they, those are very useful treatment we can use for metastatic patient, but also in the setting of adjuvant. Of course, we need to know if your melanoma has the BRAF mutation. This is a test we do in pathology, and 50% half of the patient have this BRAF mutation. Next slide. On the other side, what have been developed for 20 years, immunotherapy for cancer, immunotherapy for melanoma. We used to treat with BCG, inject-like tuberculosis uh, uh, bacillus in the tumor to increase immune uh, system. We used to give interferon for many, many years. And now we have new treatments. We thought it was gonna be vaccine. And a lot of research have been done on vaccine, but now, research has turned toward what we call checkpoints, which is actually molecules in between lymphocytes and um, we call presentating cells. So we block with anti special uh, antibodies those uh, interrelation in between the lymphocytes and the antigen presenting cells in the blood, or either we block with PD-1 blockade directly at the site of the tumor to stimulate the lymphocyte to kill the bad cancer cell. So I would say that it's one of the biggest discovery in cancer 
field for the last 10 years, actually won the Nobel Prize this year of medicine, discovering the fact that CTLA-4 blockade in the blood stimulate to develop active lymphocyte that will go and kill the tumor with the help of anti-PD-1. So really this new way of treating cancer is probably the best uh, discovery in the field of cancer, not only in melanoma, but also in lung cancer. We use it now for kidney cancer, um, uro, uh, genital cancer, etc. Next slide. So as I said, the molecule we use for that is ipilimumab when we work to block CTLA-4. This was used, I would say, seven and eight years ago. But now, more specifically, next slide, <clears throat> we use anti-PD-1, which are called pambrolizumab and nivolumab. This is Ketruda, this is Obdivo. Those specific antibodies, as you see in the diagram here, block the break. So if we block the break, we will give the chance of the immune reaction to restart and the lymphocytes will kill the tumor cell. Next slide. So this is another slide from Georgina Long, where we see a great summary of the last 10 years of research in the field of advanced metastatic melanoma. We used to give chemotherapy with a response at two years of a, a survival of 10%. Now, with epidemiumab, we know that we have 20% survival. Next slide. But all the new treatments that have been developed, this we see like targeted therapy for those patients that have the BRAF mutation, 40, 45% survival at three years. 50% survival for anti-PD-1, even going up to 55, 58% in a combination of anti-PD-1 plus ipilimumab. So really, we have started here at 10%, climbed to 20% with ipilimumab, and now we are in the ballpark of 40, 45, 50% survival, which is an extreme great improvement, but not there yet. We want to have a 100% cure rate, of course. Next slide. Those treatments don't count without side effects. So targeted therapy, the main side effects are here. This is from Combi Day study. We see that the main side effects is fever and chills, we call pyrexia. This happens in up to 50% of the patient, especially when you're using a combo, and about 10% very severe. So most of the time, we don't have to stop the treatment. We, we need to control that. We can, ash, we can have like rash, or a, a nausea, diarrhea, uh, um, joint pain, and skin rashes. So most of the side effects are fever and chills. We can have other systemic side effects, but most of the time, we can manage and the patient can continue. Next slide. I apologize, this is a diagram explaining the side effect of immunotherapy. Really, this is a big change in the management of cancer because we used to know the side effects for chemotherapy, especially neutropenia with fever. Patient come at the emergency room with fever, we give antibiotic because the blood counts go down. In immunotherapy, it's completely different. We have a brand new range of new side effects, and we advise the patient very carefully about that when we start a treatment. Immunotherapy is used in the metastatic uh, world for everybody that don't have the BRAF mutation. It's often used in the patient with BRAF mutation before or after targeted therapy. And we explain the patient they can have most of the time colitis, which is like diarrhea, they can have pneumonitis, difficulty to breathe, cough, they have skin rash, they can have a problem with their eye, they can have problem with their hypophysitis, pituitary gland. So a lot of possible side effects. The good news is they are easy to treat most of the time with prednisone. And 
oncologists all across Canada are well trained and they understand the side effect well, so we can manage them pretty fast. And uh, with anti-PD-1 alone, the side effect not too bad. The side effect usually bigger when we give a combination of ipilimumab plus anti-PD-1, but this treatment we usually limit for young patients with severe disease or brain metastasis. Next slide. <clears throat> so now we jump in the new advance uh, we call adjuvant therapy. So it's not surprising that with great results, like I just shown you with metastatic treatment, that studies have been started five years ago, seven years ago, to use those medications for advanced local disease, but in a patient to prevent spreading of the disease. So this is the case with the study we've done, Combi AD, and study done in immunotherapy, nivolumab and pembrolizumab. Next slide. So this is a summary of everything new in the field of adjuvant therapy. We used to give interferon with a low increase, very low increase of survival, a lot of side effect, fatigue, depression, a lot of systemic side effect. And now we see all the new uh, molecules that have been developed. The first one was 2015 epilimumab, very promising with great result. 25% and more decrease of chance to die, but too much side effect. So in Canada, you see US here, epilimumab was not proposed to Health Canada and was not never used as an adjuvant treatment. Why? Because BMS and Merck knew that better treatment were coming up, nivolumab and pembrolizumab. And this were, uh, those studies were done using anti-PD-1, mostly in patients with, without BRAF mutation, to prevent recurrence and increase survival. Dabratramitinib, this is the combo we've discussed before. This was done in the trial we've done all across Canada and in the US and in Australia, in patients with BRAF mutation to prevent recurrence with excellent results, like we'll see, increase survival. Next slide. So we started with this, no treatment. When you have an advanced stage three, which means your disease is in the lymph node, either you find by Sentinel or you have a big lymph node dissection, you have 45% of dying of your disease. Often uh, very bad. Next slide. Next slide. So interferon was given for 20 years because we know we decrease the risk of recurrence and a slight improvement of survival by decreasing the risk of death. But you see it's very subtle, like three to 4%. Next slide. So definitely we need we needed better treatment than interferon. So the first publication that was presented last year at ESMO in Madrid. Um, next slide. Next slide was a combination of dabrafenib plus tramitinib. In that study, they use half in 870 patients, which is a big trial. They use half of the patient with the combo and half of the patient with placebo. And we followed the patient for many years. Next slide. This was presented last uh, two weeks ago in Munich. And people were very excited to see that even a four year follow up, the curve are still very distinct with at least, in that case, 16% difference in the relapse at four years for those patients that have received a combo as compared to placebo. Next slide. And this translates in a difference of survival of more than 10%. So for us in the field of melanoma, it was very exciting because we never, never had those numbers with interferon. So excellent result with Dabra Tramé. Next slide. Of course, half of the patient cannot receive this treatment because they don't have the BRAF mutation. And some patients would prefer, we would prefer to give a treatment to boost the immune system. So this study came by comparing nivolumab on CPD1 to ipilimumab because as I just said before, ipilimumab was shown, shown 
to, the, to increase survival compared to placebo. Next slide. So in that trial, a big, slide, a big trial again, 500 patients treated either with nivolumab or ipilimumab. Next slide. And again, this is a, a less advanced uh, this, uh, study. It was done uh, after combi AD, but the preliminary results telling us a very, very um, a, a good result six, uh, I'm calculating well, 13% difference in relapse, which is much better than interferon. And the results for uh, survival will come this year. And we are expecting as good result for survival improvement. And don't forget in that study was not compared to placebo, was compared to an active treatment, epilimumab. Next slide. Decrease of distant metastasis by 10% as compared to ipilimumab. Next slide. Finally, the other anti-PD-1 is pambrolizumab, Kitruda from Merck. Again, another uh, very good study was published, uh, published this year in New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Agerman and all the co-investigators. Next slide. In that study, the difference is we compare pembrolizumab to placebo. Again, in a group of patients with uh, disease in their lymph node, so no metastasis. We operate the patient at the hospital. We remove the tumor. We remove the lymph nodes that are affected by the melanoma. And then we offered either pembrolizumab or placebo and follow the patient. The nice thing about this trial is that the patient, yes, they were compared to placebo, but if they recurred, they were given the medication. So it, we call that study just for fun, like pembrolizumab before or pembrolizumab after recurrence. Next slide. Results, excellent, 20% different, 20% difference as compared to placebo for relapse. Next slide. Same thing for distant metastasis. So see if you are unlucky and you get a recurrence near the scar, you often you can operate, but if you have recurrence in the lung or liver, not very good. And then you, um, you will uh, need some systemic treatment. So in that case, we decrease by 13, 14% the risk of having distant metastasis. Again, this trial too young, to have some survival benefit. Next slide. So this is the big uh, a graph now that we have. We used to have no treatment or interferon. And we thought we were gonna have ipilimumab, but not filed in Canada because too toxic. And we have better options now. We have excellent results with Tabaratrame. Uh, combi, uh, combination of uh, dabrafamid tramitinib to decrease the risk of death. You see, we think it's maybe up to 20% decrease of death and the same thing maybe like 30% decrease of recurrence, which is a huge difference. And same thing, you see the comparison with Nivo and Pambro, same magnitude of improvement by decreasing relapse and we are expecting good results for survival also when the studies are more mature. Next slide. So I want to finish with uh, this slide telling us that, yes, it's good to cure melanoma with systemic treatment. It's good to prevent recurrence, but it's even better if you prevent the development of melanoma. Next slide. And this is uh, on the right what I recommend that you wear. This is uh, taken from an Australian beach. Of course, not always popular in Canada, but always good to have a nice tilly hat, a TUV shirt, long pants, and cover up. Thank you very much for your time, and I'll be uh, available for questions. If anybody has any questions now, you can go ahead and type them on your screen. Um, 
but we'll probably start moving forward. Uh, Dr. Clevel, thank you as always. Um, excellent presentation. Uh, you know, for me as a stage four melanoma patient, it's always exciting to see these treatments that I had the fortune of getting uh, coming into those earlier adjuvant settings. So uh, thank you for that. Um, our second presenter is uh, Adrian. I'm not even going to try to butcher your last name, Adrian. <laughs> Uh, no now we did a great job of introducing you at the beginning, so now I would like to hand the uh, screen over to you. Great, thank you very much, Kathy. And, and just can I confirm that you can see the screen and hear my voice? We see you and hear you. Perfect, thank you very much. And I just want to extend a thank you to the Save Your Skin Foundation to, for this invitation to speak here. Uh, really is an honor and a privilege to speak on this topic. So. Just as a little bit of background, as mentioned, uh, I'm a medical science liaison for Novartis, uh, and I spent some studies, you know, studying uh, cell signaling pathways that contribute to tumor progression. So this is an area that is really close to my heart to talk about uh, targeted therapy and adjuvant melanoma. Uh, just quickly, uh, and also just kind of following on on the back of uh, Dr. Clavo, he did a really nice job of of setting the landscape. So some of the elements I might go a little bit quick over because he already touched on them. Okay. But just some quick uh, disclaimers, as you heard from Natalie at the beginning, uh, Tefinlar and Mechanist or Debrafidib and Tremendib are approved uh, in the adjuvant setting for patients with melanoma that have a BRAF E600 mutation and involvement of lymph nodes following a complete resection. Uh, they're also approved for the treatment of patients uh, that have unresectable metastatic melanoma with a BRAF E600 mutation. And also importantly, you know, the information we're going to go over today is really for informational and educational purposes only and, and is really not to provide any medical advice and, sh and should no way replace any clinical judgment by a healthcare professional. So with that being said, I want to kind of start with an outline and I was tasked with talking about targeted therapy. And so to talk about targeted therapy, it's important to start with the target. So we're going to go into the background on BRAF, mutant melanoma, uh, and specifically a little bit more information on BRAF, just get into a little bit more detail on that. Um, the mechanism of action with respect to targeted therapy on acting on that target and how we might intervene. And then updates with respect to where we are in Canada in, in adjuvant treatment with, uh, with, in, with respect to BRAF, mutant melanoma, uh, and targeted therapy. So in starting with the target, it's really important to talk about BRAF mutation uh, for a couple of reasons. And Dr. Clevo already really nicely mentioned this, but essentially BRAF mutations are the most common mutation in cutaneous melanoma. And up to 50% of melanomas might harbor this mutation. So one important point is they're very frequent. A lot of melanomas have BRAF mutation. Now, the second reason to kind of highlight the BRAF uh, mutations are important is that it tends to drive the, the disease, that, that it is a driver mutation that contributes to the tumor progression. Now, uh, another reason that I'm going to touch on on the next slide is that thinking about in the adjuvant setting is where does BRAF mutation actually occur in the timeline of tumor progression? Uh, and if we just take a look at this image here, which is depicting uh, the skin and a, and a melanoma progressing over time, and you can see the top layer of the skin here, the middle, and then the bottom, and you see these purple cells, which are the melanocytes that have become transformed, uh, and then progress over time uh, in the various stages of melanoma until they get all the way over to the right where you're looking at a metastatic melanoma uh, and it's progressed such that it now can escape the primary tissue uh, and then uh, metastasize or spread to other organs potentially. And what's interesting is if you look along the bottom, these are some of the genetic alterations that occur during this timeline of progression of melanoma. And if you look at the red box, and if you look at where BRAF mutation actually occurs, it happens early on in this process. Uh, and this is an important point, especially when we're talking about adjuvant, an adjuvant setting and adjuvant therapy. If we can identify the target earlier, and because it's happening early, and we can identify it early, if we could potentially intervene earlier, it, it's the hopes that we can potentially prevent patients from getting to a metastatic stage as Na Natalie, Kathy, and Dr. Clevo mentioned. So that's really the goal. We can identify a target and try to intervene uh, early as well. So to just get into a little bit of more uh, detail on, on the BRAF pathway, I know Dr. Clevo touched on it, uh, but I wanted to go into the, the molecular signal that, that drives that tumor growth and proliferation. And if we focus on this signaling pathway on the right, what we're looking at is a communication cascade that happens in our cells every single day, where you have a cell membrane and a receptor, and a control signal like a growth factor would bind to that receptor and then activate a cascade into the uh, internal uh, parts of the cell to transmit a signal to the cells to grow and proliferate. 
And now normally this happens under a very controlled setting where a growth factor has to bind for this to become activated. And each step in the chain becomes activated based on the previous step. Now, when we look at a BRAF mutation, this step in the chain, this protein becomes mutated in such a way that it no longer needs the previous step in the chain to become activated. It's always active or constitutively active. And because of that, it starts to drive the growth and proliferation via this pathway called the MAP kinase pathway. So you get a stimulation of growth and proliferation. But as mentioned, we can identify that target through um, diagnostic techniques, identify that mutation, and then potentially intercept that signal with medication. So in this case, we're looking at dibrafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor, and trametinib, which inhibits uh, the MEK protein, the next step in the chain, to essentially try to block stimulation of tumor growth and proliferation. And, and as Dr. Clavo mentioned, uh, you know, there are other um, targeted agents available in Canada, of course, demurafenib and cobimetinib, um, but in the adjuvant setting, dibrafenib and trametinib are the only ones uh, currently approved. So the focus of this is going to be getting into a little bit more detail on that and the studies on that. So really the takeaway is that BRAF is important. Uh, BRAF mutations are important, but we can't intercept them with targeted therapies. So this is the background on the molecular side of things. Well, how does it actually manifest clinically? And we know Dr. Clavo just very nicely uh, touched on the COMB-AD trial. Uh, so combination of DeBraf and Tremendib in the adjuvant setting. Uh, it was published in 2017, and I'll just go into a little bit more detail on it as well, um, just because, uh, again, this is the agent, these are the agents that are approved in Canada. And so this is a slide that just overviews the, um, the study design, but if I can just walk you down to this, this, uh, this section of text here to kind of identify the types of patients that were brought into the trial. So as mentioned in the adjuvant setting, we're looking at earlier stages, so in this case, these were stage three patients. So all patients coming into the trial uh, had stage three disease. And of course, stage three indicates that there's a lymphatic involvement, the disease spread to the lymphatic system, but has not yet gone metastatic um, or spread distantly. Now, all of the patients that, that would come into this trial to test the and tremendum would have to have a V600E or K mutation. So they need to have a BRAF mutation because these medications would only work for those patients that have that mutation. Um, now, in the stage three setting, the, the disease would be resected. So essentially, so they would have a surgery to surgically render them disease-free uh, uh, of that disease. But if we think about it, when the patients receive that surgery, there's always a possibility that uh, there could be microscopic disease left behind. And this is where an adjuvant systemic treatment may, may bring some benefit um, because we could try to target that, uh, that uh, microscopic disease that's potentially left. So now if we come back up to the, to the, the, the image, we can see once the patients were, um, have a BRAF mutation, have their surgery to remove their disease, they're randomized into one of two arms. Either they get dibrafenib, trametinib, uh, which is a medication taken orally and it was taken for 12 months, or they receive matching placebo pills. Following the 12 months, they are also followed up for additional time uh, for years to look for relapse to see if the disease comes back, as well as other endpoints like overall survival, as Dr. Clevo mentioned. Uh, it's really important, I think, to highlight as well the brafenum and trametinum compared to placebo and why placebo was chosen. Um, and that's an important point to, to talk about with respect to the landscape in Canada, as well as globally. Up until some of these recent studies, really um, the, the standard of care or the practical standard of care really was watch and wait and observation. So once a, sta once a stage three patient had their disease surgically removed, uh, they typically would just be observed to see if the disease would re relapse. Um, so really when we're comparing this active treatment, we're comparing it to what is actually going on globally. Uh, as, a, as a practical standard of care. And as, as Dr. Clevo mentioned, in, in Canada, we do have interferon as an available option, but as, as he mentioned, due to um, you know, limited efficacy and some toxicity or tolerability issues, it's not widely used. So really we're comparing, you know, how does this active treatment compare to what is currently being done or the status quo? Uh, and just to give you a rundown of the, the patients uh, and their baseline characteristics when they came into the trial, this is a, 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 you know, a table with a lot of information. But what to take away from it is in each arm, there's about 430 patients. So there's quite a lot of patients. It's a big trial. Uh, and also to highlight what to take away from these is if you look across the two arms, the active arm or the placebo, you can see the, uh, the numbers are relatively well matched. Uh, and, and that's what you want to take away from a table like this to just make sure that any 
difference we see in treatment might be related to the actual treatment and not uh, a difference in the in the randomization process. So now we're asking the patients that received the BRAF and have been tremendous for one year, so receiving the targeted therapy, what did their relapse look like? Uh, and Dr. Clavo did uh, nicely present this already, but here is the um, the data from uh, the, the first paper that came out in 2017 published by uh, Dr. Long, and it looks at relapse-free survival, uh, where relapse-free survival is defined as the freedom from relapse or death. Um, so to put this another way, if you look at and you follow these Kaplan-Meier plots, the yellow being placebo and the blue being reactive, at time zero, there's 100% of the patients in the trial. But as time goes on, if you start to see the line dip, it indicates that a patient is relapsing or passing away. So when you get to 12 months or one year, there's 56% of patients left, which indicates the remainder, 44%, would have relapsed or, or potentially passed away. And when you get to three years, you can see it's, it's over, it's 39% are left, so over 60% of patients have relapsed or passed away. So that watch and wait strategy, can, uh, quite a few patients are still relapsing, as you can see. Now, the patients that received the BRAF and have been tremendous for a year, you can see the line has been shifted up. So there's a significant improvement in, in preventing relapse. And you can follow that over time. And we can use uh, statistical uh, methods to calculate the difference. And Dr. Clavo mentioned this as well. Um, but essentially, the hazard ratio came out to 0.47. So looking at a relative difference between the two, it's 0.47. So just to put this another way, um, when you are on the active treatment for a year and you continue to be follow up, um, you are half as likely to relapse compared to watching and waiting or observation in the placebo arm. So quite significant results with respect to receiving um, the graph and event tremendous. And he also, uh, sorry, there we go. He also mentioned there was a four-year um, update that just came out at ESMO, so the European Society for Medical Oncology Congress, a major oncology conference just a few weeks ago in October, uh, where we have additional follow-up at four years. And as mentioned, you see that uh, the results continue to hold and the hazard ratio is still 0.49, so telling us that there's still a 50% reduction or they're half as likely to, re to have a relapse when, on, when you had the active treatment compared to placebo, so significant results. The other interesting thing is that we're starting to see a flattening of the curves as well, and we need additional follow-up to, to understand this, but it is certainly promising that as this starts to flatten, it gives us the hope that there may be potentially some of these patients get a long-term benefit, which I'll talk about again in a moment. And Dr. Clevel also mentioned the overall survival data, which, which was immature because it was at uh, a first interim analysis that happened early, but even at that time point, it looked like the lines are spreading, which tells us that having the active treatment, the targeted treatment, um, may uh, actually uh, prolong survival, which is a tremendous potential result as well, um, and will be confirmed with additional longer follow-up, we hope. But certainly there is a positive uh, potential signal that, that, is, uh, that is potentially emerging. Now, in light of this, uh, at, the, at the Congress at ESMO, um, there was another piece of data that was presented as well, uh, and it was called the Curate Model. Um, and this was asked for by the European Medicines Association. So, um, you know, a health body like the FDA or Health Canada actually asked Novartis to conduct this analysis to look at whether being on, medic being on the active treatment for that year actually um, provided some sort of an estimate for a long-term relapse. So what the Curate model does is the statistical model that estimates the proportion of patients that might remain relapse-free long-term. So again, that flattening of the curve. And when, these, when this model was applied and it was estimated, you can see the patients that received the surgery, uh, you'd have about 37% of patients that might re remain relapse-free long-term. Um, and the patients that were on the targeted treatment arm, it was 54%. So proportionally, more patients had um, the potential for a long-term uh, survival without relapse. Um, now, this is, you know, it's a statistical model. It's an estimate. Um, really, what it is, it's, it's there to complement the data that we already have. But what it really does provide is a potential hope that some of these treatments are providing long-term benefit and making some of, some of these patients free from disease uh, completely. 
So we talked a lot about the effect of the medications and, and how they have a positive uh, effect on relapse and potentially survival, but it's really important also to talk about the side effects that can occur when on active medication. So here's a safety summary from Combi AD, the Combi AD trial, um, showing the various side effects or adverse effects that occur. And there were more on the dibrafenum and trimenamard versus placebo. Uh, and there were more uh, side effects or adverse effects leading to discontinuation. That means they dropped out of the study due to side effects um, on the, on the um, active arm versus placebo. And there's a couple of things to mention here is that since the study ran and since these medications have been used in practice now, we've learned a lot about them and the side effects that occur. Uh, and a lot of the side effects are um, potentially predictable and manageable. I'm gonna mention them here from the study. So if you take a look at the adverse effects that occurred, pyrexia or fever, fatigue, nausea, headache, chills, were some of the most that occurred in the actual adjuvant study. Um, now, again, I think the really important thing to highlight is that um, it's really important to talk with your healthcare professional about some of the side effects and, and be expectant of, of them and have a good plan in place to, um, to manage them as appropriate as possible, such that uh, you can be as safe as possible when, when on these medications if, if you end up on them uh, in, in any case. And again, we've learned a lot about them, so, um, so a lot to kind of talk about and be informed on. Uh, and another thing to, to touch on that did come out at ESMO that is in line with what we were just discussing is the timing of the side effects that occur. So here we see the side effects and their incidence broken out over the course of year on treatment, but broken into quarters. So the first three months, the period of three to six months, six to nine months, and nine to 12 months. And what you'll immediately notice is that the side effects tend to occur in the first three months. And so what this really highlights again is that that discussion with your with your healthcare professional about and the expectation around side effects and having a good plan in place to manage them it will be really important um, and hopefully bring the, the best benefit and safety. So in light of that, and knowing that we do have, um, and the Dr. Clevel mentioned one of the one of the top um, side effects that we saw with the brafenum tremendum is pyrexia or fever. So in light of that. Uh, Novartis was committed to conducting another clinical trial to understand this more, uh, and this is called the COMBI A plus trial, um, which is a trial that is looking at an adapted fever management uh, protocol for stage three patients that have BRAF mutation that are going to be treated with um, dibrafenib and trametinib in the adjuvant setting. So essentially, it's a safety trial where everybody's going to receive a targeted medication. It's a global trial, um, and uh, Following the beginning of the medication, there's a different protocol that we're adapting to, to see whether we can improve some of the pyrexia-related uh, outcomes that we saw in the initial trials. Because as I said, we've learned a lot about this along the way. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, our team in Canada was able to secure some sites in Canada, and uh, we've listed them here um, to just to see. And uh, we've also shared them with the Save Your Skin Foundation upon their request as well. So that brings me to the, the end of the presentation, but just to summarize, um, and we talked about BRAF mutations and how they're the most common mutation in melanoma and they, they activate the, the a signaling pathway that drives tumor progression. And really that's the target, the, the BRAF mutation. And we know that when we have targeted treatments such as dibrafenib and trametinib that have, uh, can intercept the target and potentially provide benefit in the adjuvant setting in stage three patients, um, so with lymph node involvement, that have a BRAF mutation. And we know that there are side effects that occur with the medication, but they're generally manageable, especially when you're in the know and, uh, and can, uh, can uh, have a good plan for, for managing those. And last but not least, um, we'd just like to take a moment to really thank all of the patients and their families who participated in this trial, but also all trials. Um, because as you know, and as, as was mentioned earlier in the call, there's been tremendous degree of progress in the field of melanoma both with targeted therapies as well as you know, oncologies uh, and other agents. Uh, and this is really a, a product of all of the courage and commitment and dedication of all the patients and their families uh, to, 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 that are inflicted by this disease. So thank you so much for providing so many future generations with, with hope. And that's the end of my side, and I'm happy to take questions at the end, but thank you very much, and I'll pass it back to uh, my colleagues.
Thanks, Adrian. Um, we do have some questions coming in, uh, but if uh, you want to keep typing them on your screen, we're going to get to them in a few minutes. Um, we kind of want to take a little bit, we want to change things up a little bit. Um, at Save Your Skin, that we're really proud of ourselves and the fact that we truly do represent our patients. And it's always really important uh, to us that our patients have a voice and that they be heard. And so now we are going to change it up a little bit and we're going to get a stage three melanoma patient's perspective on what it was like to get treatment in that adjuvant setting. Um, so I would like to introduce uh, Save Your Skin's very own Natalie Richardson. Natalie, can you tell us, you know, really briefly just about your journey and what it was like uh, being able to get that treatment uh, in the adjuvant setting? Yes, I'm happy to. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I shouldn't say I'm happy to tell the story, but I, I am compelled to tell the story to um, try to bring awareness to the situation and help other people who have uh, been through what I've been through in my family um, and what you know other people in the future might. So it's definitely a scary journey. And um, it's four years since I was diagnosed and it's it's honestly not not less scary. Um, just gonna one second here. There we go. Uh, in April of 2014, uh, when I was 37 years old, I was diagnosed with stage 3B nodular melanoma. A mole that had been on my hip all my life had grown and changed color and shape over the course of about six to eight months, so I reluctantly had it examined. Um, unfortunately, I had waited too long to have it checked, and tests confirmed it was melanoma and it had spread to my lymph nodes, instant stage three cancer. I really, I knew nothing about it prior to that. So um, it was definitely a, a terrible time. Uh, I have twin daughters and they were 11 at the time I was diagnosed. And so fear, it, it gripped us all. We tightened together as a family, but um, we really didn't know what to do. After receiving several opinions, I was scheduled to have extensive surgery to remove all the lymph nodes from the affected area. Uh, uh, dissection surgery, I guess it is the technical term, um, an invasive procedure in my right groin that put me on complete bed rest for two months. Um, I had a lot of time to think in that, that two months, I'll tell you. My family and friends rallied around myself and my kids, but we were all still paralyzed with dread. On top of the knowledge that this was a serious disease, we were given a realistic set of percentages, um, actually the ones that Dr. Clevel presented earlier, that directly affected conversation of my prognosis. It seemed certain that my stage 3B melanoma would spread to major organs, and it was doubtful that I would live long enough to see my daughters go to college. To say the least, we struggled to understand what the next steps were for my care, but we quickly learned there were no next steps. Um, I had the op option of interferon, but with the side effects um, that were described and the, the low percentage of it having a, a you know positive outcome, um, the low chance, I was afraid that, that still wasn't enough. Um, I was slated to recover from my surgery and then just wait to see if the melanoma progressed. It was terrifying and I was desperate for another answer. Um, miraculously, my oncologist was able to offer me a 50-50 chance at receiving immunotherapy via a clinical trial. There was one that was just closing at the time that I was, you know, in the, the right time to be able to, to enter it. Um, so my family doctor and I raced to study what immunotherapy was, and when we realized that it had the potential to dramatically improve my chance of survival, I immediately signed up for the clinical trial in Toronto. I was made aware that it was a computer randomized trial, and no matter how much I begged, my medical team couldn't guarantee I would be given the immuno-oncology. Several agonizing days passed, and I, I really did call my oncologist's office every day and beg to have, you know, please do something. I was desperately in need of immunotherapy. One day, my call was returned, and they had randomized um, my, my case number, I guess, in the clinical trial, and miraculously, I was to receive eight treatments of immunotherapy. And um, my family and I had a party, <laughs> so it was pretty exciting. And uh, the next year and a half, we, we followed all the protocols of the trial, and I had the treatments, and at this point, I am considered no evidence of disease which is extremely exciting, and I still have CAT scans every six months to keep checking, but so far so good, and with every month that passes, I'm more and more grateful, and uh, I, I look back on the whole experience with the most immense amount of gratitude 
Um, and I'm also mystified because I, I know what it feels like for other people to be in that situation and not have an option. And uh, it frightens me for them. So um, my gratitude overrides all of it. But uh, I, I really hope for, you know, better, better outcomes and, and access to treatment for patients in, with stage three melanoma. Thanks, Nat. Mm -hmm. um, a few months ago, uh, Save Your Skin was introduced to a young man named Ayub, a son and a caregiver, trying to get access to a treatment for his mom. Uh, I'd love Ayub to tell us a little bit about your family, what you've gone through over the past few months. Ayub? Um, hi, Kathy. Uh, thank you very much. Before I start, I just want to thank you for organizing it. And I want to thank everybody, the doctors and the companies that work on the research. Um, we, we, uh, I see how much advancement has been there in the last couple of uh, years. And uh, you guys are, are hope. And I really, really uh, want to thank you for all your efforts. So the only five months ago, I had no idea what's melanoma and what it, what it can do. So um, they, uh, then uh, sometimes in early 2018, my mom got diagnosed and I was shocked, but I didn't know what it is. So first thing for me was just to get her uh, surgery lined up for lymph node dissection. Um, and as soon as it was completed, uh, first First thing, I had a meeting with her oncologist and a doctor, and I was assuming there's going to be lots of treatment. Uh, you know, right after the surgery, I heard about the uh, different immunotherapies available. Um, in, in, during, the, during the meeting, a doctor told me that there is one drug available, that's the um, interferon, which she wouldn't recommend due to side effects, and all other drugs uh, that immunotherapy are out of reach because they're cost prohibitive, we won't be able to afford, and it's not covered by the, um, by the government. So um, the conversation was very nice, and the doctor mentioned that the only thing you have to do, you have to go and watch for it. If it uh, goes to stage four, then you can come back, and then we'll do the immunotherapy. Um, for, I, I left the meeting, you know, smiley, thinking, you know, everything is good. If it comes back, I'll come back. And then only something in the back of my mind say that this is serious, go and do your research. So I went and I looked at all the data, all the prognosis, and I was shocked that there's actually a 70% of chance that the, uh, the cancer will come back. And I have, I'm not doing anything, I'm just watching for it. Um, and so I went back to the doctor and I'm like, are you saying that there is a 70% of chance it's gonna come back? And she's like, yes. And are you saying that that the treatment is only available after that. And she said, yes. And I mean, that's the government policy. I, I, I begged her doctor, I'm like, what can I do? She's like, well, do you have, can you come up with $100,000? Then the treatment will be available. <laughs> so it was, it really absolutely didn't make sense, uh, sense to me because there is, the government is gonna pay for this drug anyway. It's because there is a 70, percent or chance that it's going to pay for it but why wouldn't the government pay for it now while my mom is alive can take care of my uh, dad can work can contribute to society can pay taxes because after once the drug uh, the it advanced to the first first stage I don't know what's going to be what, what's going to happen to my mom so um, it's and the second thing that comes to your mind it's complete desperation the question you ask yourself as a patient or the caregiver why don't I have $100,000? What have I done wrong in this life that I couldn't, cannot afford that $100,000? So it is, there is absolute desperation at that point because you're just sitting and watching. Um, at that point, the only thing I could do is I just tried everything I could. I did extensive online research. I uh, looked the option to sign up for clinical trials. I called every single clinical trial that was listed on the clinical trial website and nothing was open for my mom. And then I searched for Cancer Canada and found the link with the patients. Um, like, and then I came across with um, Save the Skin Foundation. I started talking to Kathy, and then I realized that it's a common problem that everybody in the in Canada is going through uh, sort of the same problem. So <clears throat> it's 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 very interesting because we always 
brag about Canadian healthcare system. We're always uh, proud of Canadian healthcare system. We always say that in Canada we live at, on average more than people you, you live in U.S. But when you look at the U.S., they do cover it in U.S. <laughs> they do cover in uh, in uh, in Europe as well. So <clears throat> it's been it's been shocking last five months of the journey for me, and. Um, Eventually, I think there's some chance that Katie can mention about it that there's going to be opening from the uh, this provider of these drugs for uh, in the, on the compassionate care. So I'm very hopeful that my mom will be able and uh, to access the drug. Other than that, what we are doing is just going to the test CT scans. Very scared every couple of months and watching, watching that what the doctor is going to say the results are. So that's all I can say. Thanks, Ayub. Um, I guess at Save Your Skin, it, it's really important for us to always um, really talk about what it feels like in that place in your life. And, and I can only talk to that too well. But a lot of our stage four patients that we, you know, have survived, we were all in that wait and watch uh, space. And I think we did a, Save Your Skin did a mental wellness survey uh, this past year. And what we heard loud and clear was the worst place in the journey was when we were all left. When we were told we had a disease uh, that, that could be life threatening, uh, that there weren't really treatments available. There might be some, but we might not be able to get them. and. So it's really important to us that we always keep keeping that at the, the forefront of everything we do. We are patients, we are family, we are people that, um, you know, have, you know, have always had faith in our healthcare system. And, and we need people to know what it's like really truly in this journey for all of us. So thank you, Ayub, for that. Nat, I'm gonna pass it back over to question for you. I know you have the questions, but I do wanna to say to everybody you know, that's joined us today, please stay tuned for more webinars on this topic because we know that there's gonna be new information becoming uh, available. The one thing that we learned in melanoma is we, ma we move fast and furiously. Uh, and tomorrow is another day. Tomorrow will be another uh, something new in our landscape. So please keep an eye on us and our Facebook page and our newsletters to see what we've got coming up. So Nat, over to you. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Yeah, we've had a few questions come in, and um, I know we don't have a ton of time left. But as I promised, any anybody that we don't um, get to answer here, we will email definitely. Um, one of the questions. Um, it's interesting because there's quite a few questions from patients at different different timelines in their journey. So here's one, and then I'd like to contrast it with another. But um, this patient has asked, uh, she's had interferon and just finished in May of 2018. Should she be asking her doctor about further treatments, especially with all these new drugs that have come out? Which I think is, is interesting. She's had interferon already. Is there anything else she can do? I'm there, Joelle. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, if the person have received interferon, like a patient I saw yesterday, uh, now it's in the, it has been treated in the adjuvant setting. So we will have for a careful, recommend a careful clinical follow-up, maybe some radiologic testing. But for now, it's not the time to give a new treatment if the, the, you don't have any recurrence. You should not forget that after two years, after the initial surgeries, your risk risk of relapsing decrease. So if things go well, then it will be less stress. And maybe the fact that you receive interferon helped you because interferon is not ineffective at all. It's less effective than the new treatments that are coming up. But since the treatment was done now, I don't think there is no uh, indication for a treatment right now. Okay. Thank you. That may actually answer the next question I was going to, to read out um, from a patient who is uh, stage 3A and had one year of interferon in 2012. She's now seven years NED. Same thing. Would she continue to watch and wait or does she have access to adjuvant treatments at this point? No. Adjuvant treatment is given usually in the, the few months after we have the um, diagnosis stage three disease. So most of the time it's after the sentinel lymph node, biopsy positive, 
or the lymph node dissection if it was a clinical palpable disease, or the third scenario is if you have a local recurrence. So when you are followed by your dermatologist, family doctors, oncologists, you find a local recurrence nearby the scar, you remove it by surgery, and now it's time to consider adjuvant. So adjuvant is the next few months after the disease is re, um, removed. And after that, it's careful follow-up. The patient have a very important role in following themselves, watching the scar, palpate around the scar and the lymph node area. Often I teach the family members to watch uh, their uh, loved one and uh, palpate with them and try to look for tiny uh, uh, blue or red uh, bumps around the scar, which may be sign of recurrence. So the patient has an important role in follow-up and the family members and the family doctors too. Mm, that's very important. Good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one one more question, uh, Dr. Joel. I, I think this is, uh, I'm not familiar with this, but is there any development with anti-LAG3 or LAG3? Is that a... So in immunotherapy now, the researchers from uh, basic science are giving you a lot of hope because they try to find new targets to activate the, the, uh, the immune system. So we have seen excellent results by combining epilimumab with nivolumab. And this is a treatment we use for advanced disease, especially brain metastasis, but it's toxic with some side effects. So the research, the research now is going toward finding new um, targets where we can use combination of immunotherapy, except example, anti-PD-1 plus anti-lag or anti-PD-1 plus other molecules um, attacking the stimulating the lymph, lymphocytes. So yes, it will be the tool of the future, but for now, it's only on clinical trial that we're using this, and especially in the advanced setting. So the, re the answer is yes, it's very promising, but it's not for clinical use right now. It's more in the research uh, field. Interesting. It's so interesting to watch what's, what's being developed. Excellent. Yeah, the, the um, aim the aim is to develop a more efficacy, uh, effic efficient uh, combination with less side effects. So as we saw, you remember my graph with the 50% cure rate right now or control rate at three years. We want to raise that to 80, 90% by comb combining different agents, maybe even combining targeted therapy with immunotherapy at the same time. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Kathy, I might um, hand it over to you too. Did you have something to add or, or a question to add? Uh, no, I, I I think we've kind of kind of covered everything. Um, you know, we heard at ASCO and uh, at ESMO uh, this year about all the work being done in, in adjuvant treatment for melanoma. So, Dr. Clavo, do you foresee any more clinical trials coming in the adjuvant setting in the near future? Yes, we are doing some actually right now. So, um, of course, when the medications are available, uh, we will be uh, fortunate, probably everywhere in Canada, to offer either targeted therapy or immunotherapy anti PD1 for patients for BRAF. It will be a decision of the patient and the physician, and immunotherapy for the wild type. But probably some new arrangement will be developed, trying to probably try to have shorter duration of treatment, maybe less than one year, maybe again combining different agents of immunotherapy. This is being done and maybe um, trying uh, new molecules too. But I would expect that those three options that I discussed will be there for at least 10 years because we really had nothing else than interferon for the last 20 years and this is a big breakthrough for now. So yes, new options will be developed and new combination maybe will be tried to try to raise the bar again. But I think this, what we have right now, it's very promising and excellent. I, just before we finish, I really want, want to congratulate uh, Cathy, Natalie and all the, the participants in the, the, uh, the webinar. I mean, it's excellent for the patient to uh, explain and um, 
Thanks for your continual support for all our patients all across Canada. It's really a great, uh, great work that you do either uh, directly with the patient to support them in their journey, but also uh, coming with us to uh, influence the governments to cover those medications which are not always difficult, um, easy to, uh, to have available. Congratulations. Well, we would like to thank you and challenge you to keep raising that bar. Uh, Nat, I'll hand it back over to you to close the wrap. Okay, thanks. Thank you also from myself for, for all the work you do. And uh, thank you for everyone who's speaking today. And uh, also for the questions that came in, we will uh, we'll be in touch by email. Um, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar session. And uh, please feel free if you think of any questions after, also to, to email us, uh, kathy at saveyourskin.ca or myself, Natalie, at saveyourskin.ca, and we'll get in touch with, you know, if we need to, to find the answers for you, we will do that. Thank you all for joining, and uh, this ends the webinar session. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you, everyone, bye.